really just the two of us? Um, isn't there a class today, Professor? Yeah, that's why I'm confused. It's just the two of us. It's Tuesday, right? It's yes, it is Tuesday. Or almost 5 minutes before 5 p.m. Yeah, weird. Um, college ditch day. <laughs> um, I did mention something about having an alumni speaker at six. Maybe everybody just assumed there was no class before six. Um, I can contact the class Discord. Yeah, that would be great. I joined five minutes early. I didn't realize no one else had joined. It. Okay, here comes another person. Hmm. Well, we'll wait until we get more. Okay, now people are starting to show. Okay, wait a few more minutes since it's only a handful of people here. Um, professor, I have a question. Yeah. Um, I remember last week you mentioned that an alumni is going to visit our, our class. Is yes, it today at six? Today? Okay. Okay. All right. There's only five students here. Six. I want to get at least a few more people before I get going. So one thing a number of people emailed me about is that in this situation, it turned out that the right fault, what I'm calling the right principal plane was actually to the left of the left principal plane. You might say, well, how meaning that we had a situation like this. So 
So if I were to uh, draw, here is the right uh, focal plane. Here is the left focal plane. And then uh, I'll do that in a different color. Left, the right focal plane and the right principal plane. And their separation was F. And then here was the uh, left focal plane. And here was the left principal plane. And that can absolutely happen. In fact, it happened in this assignment. And yeah, it can seem weird, it can seem counterintuitive, but if doing it that way gave you data that satisfies the thin lens equation, then it should be good. Any questions on that? All right, well, until our alumni speaker gets here, I'm going to be talking today and then on Thursday about zoom lenses. Now, zoom lenses have nothing to do with the um, video conferencing software. The basic idea of a zoom lens is that it's, an, it's a lens with adjustable focal length. All right, so the idea of a camera is you've got a system of lenses, there's your camera, and then you've got some distant object and a bunch of points on that, a bunch of rays from a point on that distant object all go to the same point in the, uh, detector plane, right? And so if they make, if all those rays, you look at them and you say, well, they don't make exactly the same angle. No, but they make very close to the same angle. Theta, here is Y equals F tan theta. And if we wanted to magnify the image, then what we would want to do is we'd want to get a longer focal length. Such lenses exist, you can buy them. And I, when I put this topic on the syllabus, naively said, okay, I mean, they exist. I'll just look at one of the designs and I can explain the basic idea. We can walk through a matrix calculation to predict what the focal lengths and positions should be. And then we'll put them into ZMAX. Then I uttered the most famous of last words uttered by people who have never done something before. How hard can it be? And so today will be, today and Thursday will be partly, I'm gonna tell you what I'm able to tell you about it. And you might say, all right, well, why is this guy who only knows a little bit about it telling us anything about it? Um, a couple of reasons. First and foremost, because what I do know about it at least conveys the principles behind how it works starting point. And because it is a chance to carry out an exercise in using these matrices and seeing what they're good for besides the highly contrived situations that I devised a little while ago, uh, seeing why sometimes matrices are actually better than ZMAX for the first stage of setting up a problem. And also I learned some new ZMAX features while um, practicing with this. So we're going to learn what we can learn from this because zoom lenses exist and illustrate a lot of concepts. So if we were looking at a close-up object, we wouldn't even necessarily need to change the focal length. If we just had a close object, 
then we could just say, okay, here's our set up our optic axis. We've got our lens, we've got our object, and we form an image. Then we could move the lens closer to it. All right, pretend it was still the same size, the same lens. Closer, we move it to a distance S1 prime, and then we would get a longer image distance S2 prime, and our magnification increases. That's great for close-up objects, but for distant objects, it's not going to work because for distant objects, no matter how you move that lens, unless you get literally quite close to it, the, the uh, distance is still much, 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 much more than a focal length. All right. So there are a few ways that we could vary the uh, focal length of a lens combination. One thing we could do is we could just take two lenses Right. And we say one over the effective focal length of this combo is one over F1 plus one over F2 minus D over F1, F2. All right, that's one thing that we could do. Um, the only, well, you, you tell me, we, we, could, we could change the distance between them as D increases, since we've got a minus sign here, one over the effective focal length increases, sorry, D, as D increases, one over the effective focal length decreases. So the effective focal length increases. Can anybody see something that might be a little bit annoying about that? And that might not be the most desirable solution. Um, does it relate to the, um, the distance D? Well, it, it actually comes down to the simple fact that if I move these two things apart, then the image plane will move. So what you could do instead is you could move this one forward and that one forward. That's one thing you could do. So you have to move at least, you have to move two lenses, right? And that turns out because you have more moving parts, it's a more complicated thing to get right. Not impossible, I'm gonna show you some systems where people did decide to move two parts. But oftentimes you want to leave at least one focusing element fixed with respect to the image plane. It's often desirable to leave a focusing element fixed with respect to the image plane. All I mean is that you should have something that's you know bolted on to the camera. So then it's bolted on to the thing that has nowadays the electronic detector, once upon a time the film, all right? Because the image plane is where ultimately all of the action happens. And that thing may be sensitive and expensive and potentially uh, easy to damage. So there are lots of reasons why you don't want to necessarily be doing things that are gonna rattle that, that are going to open up to the outside environment. Um, so one thing that people do is an A focal 
zoom lens. Does anybody remember what afocal means? Um, is it when the image is located at infinity? Yes, which is the same as having no image. Or not having a focused image. I guess it has an image, it doesn't have a focused image. So the image is not focused. So then what you can do is you can have your camera. It's got whatever lenses in there. It's got your detector. You don't have to change anything here. And then you put an attachment on the front. And this attachment basically acts like a telescope. Remember when we had the telescope, F1, F2, Right, you've got the image forming there. F1 away, F2. And so the image forms like that. And then the uh, rays, oh no, wait, sorry. I, I did something wrong here. They shouldn't be, well, make the image like that. All right, it should be like that. I'm sorry. So the image forms up there. F1. F2, and this Y is equal to F1 tan theta one, but it's also equal to F2 tan theta two. And so we get the tan theta two over tan theta one equals F1 over F2. Two. All right, that's one way that you could increase the focal length of a lens. You basically take your camera, bolt a telescope to the front of it, making it, people sell things that you could do that with. You know, you just snap a, uh, an accessory onto the front of a camera, and there you go. You have a longer focal length. Problem is that this is not adjustable. Right? It's a focal, but it's not adjustable. So instead, what we would like to do is to create a system of three lenses. F1, F2, F3. And we'll call this one X. And we'll call this one, this whole length D, and we'll call this D minus X. Actually, let me make sure that's the notation I used in my Mathematica file for, um, let's see. X and D minus X. Yeah, okay. I just needed to make sure that was the notation I used. And I'm starting with the simplest possible design. And I'm going to prove that it doesn't quite work, but it's fair, but it's simple enough. It has few enough variables that it can illustrate a few concepts. Any questions on what I set up here? All right, well, let's think about how we would model this. By the way, the idea is that if D is fixed, only the middle lens moves. 
So this is a lens where you're only going to have one moving part and you know that it's going to satisfy a lot of space constraints. You're not gonna to have to worry about it getting longer or whatever. Let's think about what this is going to do to rays of light. We're going to bring in rays of light at an angle theta. And on the far right side, are we going to actually um, bring them to a focus? What can we say about theta two? This is a telescope. It's going to magnify things. So theta two is equal to some magnification that we haven't yet worked out times theta one. Theta two, theta one is equal to theta two y two, excuse me, a b c d theta one y one. That's equal to a theta one plus b y one, c theta one plus d y one. We're trying to pick the values of D and F1 and F2 and F3, so that we get something that behaves like a telescope for all X values. What are some things we could say about the matrix elements? Before we've done any of the multiplications, we're just thinking, all right, we haven't picked F1, F2, or F3. We haven't picked D. But we know that however we pick them, we need to get them so that certain matrix elements satisfy certain conditions. Can anybody describe one of those conditions to me? Um, would B be zero? B should absolutely be zero. And in that case, what's the physical meaning of A? Um, wouldn't it be the angular magnification? Yes, it would. So let's, uh, let's set this up. I posted on Blackboard a file. I posted several files for today. One is called Matrices VO4 Telescopic, Telescopic Triplet. So I will pause a moment. Yeah, are you seeing my uh, screen? It's hard to tell. Yeah, okay, I see it on my other device. That's the one. All right, I'll give everybody a minute to download that. So you might know why there aren't more people here. Um, I know there's a e and m midterm tomorrow, but that's my only guess. I specifically said that there would be an alum coming today. And this guy has hired our graduates. Well, eight of you will get a chance to uh, talk to this guy in depth. If anybody feels, you don't have to, but if anybody feels like announcing on Discord that we have an alumni visitor coming soon, by all means, feel free to do so. It's mildly embarrassing that we don't have better turnout. <sighs> okay. So we start out as we always have to, we have to define our translation and lens matrices. Then I 
created a function called triplet. It just defines a triplet that way. And M is the matrix for a triplet with these three focal lengths and lens spacings X and D minus X. And we look at M and we had said that element B, the upper right element would have to be zero in order for this to work. So let's take a look at that. And when we take a look at that, we get a big mess. Now, what I would do at that point is I would start collecting coefficients. See, all right, there's gonna be three types of terms in here. There's gonna be the terms that don't depend on X. There's gonna be the terms that are linear in X. And there's gonna be the terms that are quadratic in X. You got an X here and another X in there. And we could do that by hand, but I just decided to say, okay, let's, uh, let's collect those terms. We can have Mathematica treat that as a power series. I think I could have also used the collect command. Let me see if that would work. Uh, yeah, that would that would also work. All right, either of them will work. I'm gonna go back to the series command because the answer it gave me was slightly cleaner. All right, so in order to make that matrix, we're gonna first look at this matrix element, all right? So, sorry, we're gonna look at this uh, coefficient. We need negative D minus F1 plus F3 to be zero or D equals F3 minus F1. So I set D equal to F3 minus F1. That will automatically make all of this go away. And then I can plug that into the first term. When I plug it into the first term and simplify it, I get this. Hang on a second. Now, F2, if I wanted to make this zero. We need to make this term zero. So F2 becomes minus F1 over two. And we again, simplify our matrix and we're left with a problem here. This matrix element is quadratic. Now that's not as that's not a, a terrible problem because for small x, x squared is less than x, right? So it's actually kind of nice. We can have a system where for very small values of x, so we just adjust it a little bit, we just move that lens a little bit to the left or right, we still get that b is zero. We still get an afocal system. It's not exactly a focal. The rays will be either diverging ever so slightly or converging ever so slightly, but just a little bit. They're gonna be behaving like the object is almost at infinity. And if the object is almost at infinity, then the camera lens will still work fine for it. All right, then we can try out the uh, magnification of this thing because the magnification will be this matrix element and F square, F1 squared plus two F1 X plus two X squared over F1 times F3. So, We've got that. And initially it would be, I'll put in F1, F1 over F3. Any questions so far?
I want you to take away two things. I want you to take away the process. If we have an afocal system, then for this afocal system, um, we need one of the matrix elements to be zero because we need theta two to only depend on theta one, not y one, so that we've got a uh, device that's producing an angular magnification. And then the other matrix element will just be our magnification. All right, well, now we're going to try a different thing. If we can't get a system that has, that works for all X values, and remember this matrix element up here is only zero for a single X value. If we can't get a system that works for all X values, then our next best thing might be to try a system where both of the lens spacings are adjustable. Well, that's, that's a more complicated system. And I said before, the more complicated systems aren't great. But remember, I'm stipulating something where you've got this telescope, and it is a telescope, it might not always look like one, but it's an afocal attachment that produces angular magnification bolted onto the front of the camera. So the main camera lens and the detector are all bolted together. They're not moving with respect to each other. It's just this other thing out here that has a bunch of moving parts in it. Any questions on that idea? All right, so let's set up the matrices for that. Um, we're going to try a triplet that's symmetric. At least it's symmetric and it could potentially be symmetric. And the reason why is that if we want a magnification of one, you can prove that the symmetric case has the fewest aberrations. So we wanna say, all right, it's gonna have some default configuration that's pretty good. So we're gonna make it symmetric, F minus F over two F. Can anybody tell me why I chose these three? I mean, the first and third focal lengths have to be the same. Can anybody guess why the middle focal length is minus F over two? What aberrant situation might we be trying to avoid? A spherical aberration? Not spherical. Can I take one over F? plus one over minus F over two. Let's uh, switch screens. So we've got F minus F over two and F. One over F plus one over minus F over two plus one over F. Well, let's see here that one half in the denominator, one over one over two is two. So I get one over F plus two over minus F plus one over F. Um, that's two over F plus two over minus F, which is zero. Does anybody remember what that was referring to? Um, field curvature? Yes, field curvature. It's not an absolutely required thing. You don't necessarily need zero field curvature, just very small, but we're gonna try that initially. It simplifies some things. Okay, so back to Mathematica. We set up these three matrices. Then we look at the upper right element, because again, we want theta two to just equal magnification times theta one. Well, one case where this works is it's definitely gonna be zero if X1 equals X2 equals F. 
And in that case, the magnification, the angular magnification is, well, actually it's negative one, but it's a symmetric case. And I said that for magnification of plus or minus one, symmetric situations work best. But maybe I don't want to necessarily just limit myself to that case. Suppose I want to say, okay, well, what other values of X1 would make this matrix element zero? So I'm going to solve the equation, upper right matrix element equals zero, solve for X1. And I get that X1 obeys this formula. And likewise, if I solve for X2, I would get that X2 obeys the same formula. So then we can define a function called second lens spacing. And we could try to do a Taylor series for it and plot the Taylor series and plot the linear approximation. And they overlap somewhere. They kind of overlap around here. This orange line is the linear approximation. The blue curve is what it actually is. We can look at the magnification and we're working in units where the focal length of the first lens is one. And sure enough, if the separation is one, we get a magnification of negative one. And let's, uh, we could try a few other situations. Yeah, I never went with that one. Let's, uh, let's try something else. Some people design these things. They say, you know what, in this case, a little bit of field curvature won't be the end of the world. So I'm gonna replace minus F over two with just minus F. Now I'm going to do it again. And this is also zero if X1 equals X2 equals F. So again, the symmetric situations are working. Now we get something that is one over X. Um, that doesn't look right. Okay, there we go. I clicked on the wrong thing. Again, we're going to get one of these hyperbolic relationships. Any questions? Well, let's say a few things about it. Okay, first of all, people have made things like that. Uh, you don't need to download now, but here's a presentation from people at the Zeiss company about um, a focal zoom lenses. And a focal zoom lenses are, com are uh, complicated. Here they actually have three, technically these are three lens, three elements. I mean, there's two lenses here. There's one, two, three lenses here. There's another two there, but these three move together as a block. And these two move together as a block. And so they considered situations where you move one of them and you move the other one, it's going to be a more complicated mechanical design. You're gonna to have to have a system of gears set up so that um, as you move the middle one to the left, the right one moves to the right and they don't necessarily move by the same amount. You know, at first this one is moving to the right and then it's moving back and so, the behavior is going to be very nonlinear. It's going to be a complicated system of gears, but you can do it. As you can imagine, you spend a lot of money. Uh, they've made four lens systems where the nice thing here is that the left and right stand still. That means that the ends of your system won't move. There are some clear mechanical advantages to that, but the middle lenses are going to move. So this one starts moving a lot and then moves slowly. This one starts moving slowly and then moves a lot. Let's, uh, 
let's try to simulate a simple version of that. I posted a ZMAX file that's called uh, Triplet Zoom A Focal. So go ahead and download that. And I haven't finished writing project eight yet, but project eight will be posted by Thursday. And I'm gonna ask you to use a few of these features. So take a minute to download that, then we'll go through these features, then we'll take a short break, and then Jace will be here. So I'll give you a minute to download. Does anybody need more time? Okay, so let's go look at the lens data. We have three lenses here and I set them up, first of all, to be symmetric there, or at least in one case to be symmetric. We'll get to how I displayed three cases at once in a moment. But I set them up to be symmetric in one case. And I designed this one, this one, and this one to all have very specific focal lengths. You can figure those out by just clicking on the little box. And it says that the element power is 0 0.1. So if the element power is 0 0.1, what's the focal length? What's the relationship between lens power and focal length? Um, lens power is one over the focal length. Yep. So the focal length is 10 centimeters. The lens power is 0.1. Then this one has a focal length of minus 0.2. So it's minus five centimeters. And then this one again has a lens power of 0.1. Very simple BK7 lenses. I designed them with uh, just simple half centimeter thicknesses in the middle because it's convenient. Now here's the fun part. Rather than having to manually change things, I set up three configurations. You're looking at one of the configurations right now. But if you look carefully, you'll see that under the lens data, there's these arrows that click through the configurations. And every time you click to a new configuration, watch what changes and what doesn't change. This one changes and this one changes. And what I did is I used something called the configuration editor. Um, we'll set this up in a moment ourselves. But in the configuration editor, I tell it, hey, I want to take the thickness. You have to tell it there are many properties that you could specify. These are all things that could be put somewhere into a lens data sheet. But we tell it, I want the thickness of layer three, and you have to tell it layer three, or I want the thickness of layer five. And I say in the, first, in the first configuration, layer three is gonna have this thickness, layer five is gonna have that thickness. In the second configuration, layer two is gonna have this, sorry, layer three is gonna have this thickness and layer five is gonna have that and so forth. Now, if I just do a regular layout or a regular cross-section layout, I can only get it to show one of them. Even if I tell it for some reason, it always plays dumb. I've only been able to figure out how to get it to show one. But in the 3D layout, we don't have that problem. In the 3D layout, all three configurations 
show up on top of each other. And you even get to decide what offset you want between them. I have them offset by five in the Z direction, sorry, in the Y direction. You could change it to something else. They would get closer if you prefer to display it that way and vice versa. Any questions so far? Here's the best part. We can look at all the spot diagrams. And so we can see the performance and configurations one, two, and three. I learned this feature last night. I still haven't figured out how to get it to uh, put the numbers down there. But still, qualitatively, we can immediately see the differences in performance between these three cases for both the on axis and the off axis. Any questions? Um, professor, for your, um, was it 3D layout where you displayed all, the, yeah, like that? I'm not sure how to do that. 3D viewer? Mm -hmm. Well, no, display all three configurations. Um, oh, okay. What you do is, first I get rid of that. Under configuration, you click all. And then you run into a problem because they're all showing up on top of each other and that doesn't look any good. So then you change this number. change the displacement between them. Or we could even change the Z displacement between them. Because remember, this is a 3D viewer. So what I've got is an array of all three. We could do it with the shaded model, but for some reason, ZMAX has never learned that that infinite last layer should count. And I can have them show all three. And of course we run into the problem again. Any questions? Where did you open the multi-configuration editor? The multi-configuration editor? Um, I think it would, okay, so it would probably be easier to start from scratch with that than to already have it. So let's save what we've got and close it. And then find a file with two lenses. We've done lots of things with two lenses in it. So just pick some file if either on your own laptop or from Blackboard that has two lenses in it. And we'll just start from scratch there. Anybody need more time to open up a uh, file with two lenses in it? All right, hearing no complaints. Um, let's see, how did it, ah, MC editor for multi-configuration. MC editor sounds like a really geeky wrapper from the 90s. And so let's say we want three configurations. Right now we've got only one adjustable parameter and one configuration, but let's, just insert a configuration. And now let's insert another configuration. And then we have to decide what we wanna change with these two lenses. Um, if we're doing mechanical adjustments, we probably only wanna vary the spacing between the lenses. On the other hand, if we were doing um, we might want to compare different setups. We might want to change some curvatures, but let's just do the spacing between the lenses for now. 
So I've got the spacing at one in here. Um, we go to our multi configuration editor. We have to tell it what to change. I'm going to tell it to change a thickness. And actually, you can just even type. Oops. All right. And it's guessing the thickness of layer zero. I don't want to change the thickness of layer zero. I want to change the thickness of layer two. All right. Now, right now it's got the same thing in all three configurations. I'm gonna change that in configuration one, and I'm gonna change that in configuration two. And then I go to my shaded model, and I have it show all configurations. And they're all on top of each other, and that's no good. So we space them out a bit. Okay, well, now all of the two of these are out of focus. Oh, that's not enough offset between them. Let's make it eight. There. Well, these are out of focus. Problem is that right now, all three of these have the same thickness of layer four. That's an easy problem to solve. We go into our multi configuration editor and we insert another operand, another layer that we want to play with. And now we're gonna play with the thickness of layer four. Okay, now if I wanna do optimization, I can't do it in here, but I can go to my lens data sheet and I can go into configuration one and do a quick focus. Then I can go into configuration two and do a quick focus. Then I can go into configuration three and do a quick focus. And the nice thing is that when I do quick focus or if I do an adjustment, it only changes the configuration that I'm currently looking at in here. And sure enough, when we go to our multi configuration editor, we see three different thicknesses for layer two and three different thicknesses for layer four. And we see that in all four cases, the blue is, well, maybe not a great focus, but it's about as focused as it's going to be. And we can look for a configuration matrix spot diagram. The other thing you could do if you're not sure where to find it, is you just go up here in the search bar and type configuration matrix spot diagram, type config, and it says, hey, here are some options. And then we could just select configuration matrix spot diagram. Any questions? So at this point, what we've got is we've got, um, We've gone over the concept of a zoom lens. It's a lens with an adjustable magnification or an adjustable focal length. We've gone over what you need to achieve a focal zoom, which is that you need one of the matrix elements to be zero. You need the matrix element that relates theta two to Y one to be zero. And then we tested that in ZMAX and if I go back to my previous file, triplet zoom a focal. The performance was kind of blah, right? Um, 
we'll get rid of that. We don't need it. The uh, configuration matrix spot there. The performance is kind of blah, at least in one of the configurations. And so what we're going to talk about next time, we're gonna take a short break now. What we're gonna talk about next time is something called an optically compensated uh, zoom lens. But we have a visitor coming in about five minutes. So I wanna take a break now and um, be back here at six o'clock.
Hello, Jace. Can you hear me? Ah, still connecting to audio. Jace, can you hear me? I can, how are you? Pretty good, thanks for uh, joining us. Um, are you going to be uh, needing to uh, give a, are you giving a, do you have some slides or any files you need to show? Uh, no, today was a little busier than expected. Uh, so just Perfectly myself. Fine. Perfectly fine. Okay, um, it is six o'clock. So perfect timing, let's get started. All right, everyone. Um, Jace, remind me what year you graduated. Uh, 2017. 2017, okay. And this is Jace Nosel. Is it Nosel, Nosel? Uh, Nosel. Nosel, Jace Nosel. He graduated in 2017. And since then he has been working at Supply Chain Optics, a uh, company in Orange County. And why don't you tell us a little bit first about what Supply Chain Optics does before we get to your specific role. Yep. Um, so we're, uh, exactly as the name says, supply chain um, coordinator, but between uh, offshore vendors and local um, domestic OEM manufacturers, uh, original equipment manufacturers. Um, so we take anything from uh, a lens to a mirror to a, a microscope objective to um, some actual hardware assemblies and we either source it offshore completely um, and bring it in and then we test it at our in-house laboratory in Irvine. Uh, we have a very extensive optical metrology lab. Um, it can test just about any kind of optic. Uh, we're missing free form optic capability, but that's something we're bringing in soon. Um, but if, you know, there's a, a variety of parameters when you approach optics, you have uh, your surface irregularity, which is a waveform distortion of the surface. Uh, it's measured in nanometers um, or typically uh, compared to sodium or either 546 nanometers or 633 um, green or red light. Uh, and it's either a quarter wave, half wave, full wave, multiple waves, whatever it might be. Um, then you have uh, surface roughness um, down to the nanometer, uh, even angstrom, actually. Um, you, we can, the best optics production is roughly around 0.2 angstroms right now. Um, on top of that, uh, you have your, your, your typical ones, your effective focal length, um, back focal length, uh, your beam deviation, how much it steers the beam left or right uh, when it's going through what should be the true center of the lens. Um, Obviously, uh, cosmetics, uh, it's a very big one, um, especially when you're selling to uh, chemists. Uh, they typically don't understand that a small scratch doesn't actually mean anything. Uh, <laughs> uh, but um, what other parameters do we have? Uh, depending on the cut of the lens, you have parallelism, parallelism perpendicularity um, of the sides uh, of your angled cuts, which also attribute to the beam deviation of the part. Um, and uh, your throughput, um, transmission, reflection, uh, very, very important. Um, we can measure all the way down to the UV and all the way out into the, the mid IR, um, about what, 30 microns uh, is I think our capability right now. Um, so through that, um, we, you know, we're able to provide a lot of domestic manufacturers with a lot cheaper lenses than they should. Uh, <laughs> than they're able to get on the US soil um, while still guaranteeing the quality. So the, the short version is that there is a low cost manufacturer elsewhere, but the US company doesn't know if their quality control is up to snuff. And so you provide that kind of assurance. You develop the working relationships with the offshore manufacturers and you have the uh, the metrology capabilities to ensure that yes indeed it really is that good yep okay and one thing you guys should take away is that however complicated you think these assignments are right now all the things he's been saying about beam deviation things being off center irregularities the models in zmax are assuming very very smooth symmetric things 
it's even worse than whatever you think is the hardest thing on an assignment, the reality is far worse. Oh, yes. <laughs> now, tell us a little bit about what your specific job is right now in the company. Uh, so I'm our operations manager. Um, I am currently uh, also our mechanical engineer. Um, I do uh, any of the metal parts um, for the optical housings. Uh, we do have an optical designer in-house. Um, that is not me. That is somebody with a master's degree um, in optics. Uh, name's Michael. Great dude. Um, but uh, typically my day-to-day -day, um, is anywhere between uh, talking to customers, talking to vendors. Um, typically, I'm, I'm very much on the problem-solving side of things. Um, anything that really, uh, you know, the, the joke of a manager is anything that needs to get done is your responsibility. Um, uh, so I do anything and everything. Um, but it really boils down to, uh, you know, the core of our business is providing customers with really high quality parts um, and being able to weed through uh, either problem parts or um, very difficult parts to manufacture, uh, solving and setting up the metrology experiments for that. Uh, is a is a big part of it. Okay, now, um, how did you get to be the operations manager? Uh, so I started off as a lab technician. Um, I, I graduated. Uh, I actually got the job a month before I graduated. Um, one of the one of my um, one of the other students in my year, uh, Josh, was looking for a new job. Um, while he was at his, happened to uh, not wind up needing a new job, uh, but he had he had applied at this company and interviewed. They liked him, and he recommended me um, since I was looking for one as well. And you know, brought all <laughs> probably too much. Um, I brought a lot of actually Doctor Small's assignments, um, the the lens design assignments. Um, I also brought uh, my research. I did uh, plasma research with Doctor Abramson. Um, Presented all that in the interview uh, and got hired as a lab technician. Uh, immediately got kind of thrown into the special projects aspect of things. Um, and in doing that, uh, you know, mentioned to my, my boss, Adrian, um, the owner of the company, that, you know, we could really probably benefit from having SolidWorks. Um, I had some experience. I started off kind of wandering around college and uh, wound up in mechanical engineering for roughly a year and a half. Um, and I knew the program, I, I knew it would benefit us uh, because I saw a lot of drawings that were generated from SolidWorks uh, that we didn't really have the capability of, of doing anything with. Um, so we got that, started to do more mechanical engineering, um, helping with that. And then through the process of just, you know, uh, <laughs> working, Diligently, um, I wound up being the metrology lab manager um, after about a year and a half, um, directing and coordinating between uh, purchasing and um, you know sales uh, to get the parts evaluated and scheduled and have everything flow nicely out of the lab. Um, from there, uh, I just started trying to fix as many things as I could. Um, fix is a bad bad word, uh, improve. Um, and through that process, um, I, I just kind of started to intermingle between departments. And um, I, I always took any job that came to me. Uh, they're like, hey, you know, we need someone to go visit this customer because we need an application on their end. Uh, they, they need a little help with it. I was like, all right, I'll go. Um, and yeah, through that, um, I wound up doing a little bit of applications engineering, uh, some sales, um, the, obviously the, the lab still. Um, and between that and the inner workings that I helped with within the company, uh, it just kind of fit me to be the operations. Now, I remember uh, Adrian once, for those who don't know, Adrian is his boss. Um, Adrian mentioned to me once that when the company was expanding into another adjacent office space, you immediately took the initiative on figuring out how to lay out the metrology lab in the new, in the expanded space. 
something about that. He was telling me how impressed he was by that. What what was that story? Uh, so it was just uh, we were looking. You're close to the end of our lease, looking for a bigger space. Um, and he goes, "Hey, you know, um, those the place next door is opening up. Do you think we can move over there?" I was like, "Well." Um, let me lay it all out. So I modeled everything in the company on SolidWorks um, in kind of a, a broken down bit form, um, just blueprint out. I measured everything um, down to the inch, uh, modeled it all, modeled the building itself, um, threw it all together and uh, just played around with all the, all the spacing and the equipment that we had and everything wound up really smooth. Um, I, I happened to have some some suggestions that worked out that time around. Um, I've definitely had some that haven't. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if you throw out your voice and you ask people or and you, you give your opinion, um, as long as you have open ears, uh, it's usually received and considered. Um, and that's just kind of how it worked on that one. Now, you mentioned that during the interview, uh, you brought some of your assignments and projects from various classes and other things. Um, is that something that is usually done in an interview there? Because I know I hear that from students interviewing at other places, that people want to see projects or presentations of various sorts. Uh, well, that's, that's just something that's unique to Cal Poly, I think. With the amount of labs and everything that we do, um, you do have a lot of well-written reports. Um, I, I know you're a, a big person on, on writing. Um, and presentation or reports. And, you know, thanks to that, had a good background in it. Um, was able to, to bring, you know, fully professional looking reports. Um, obviously I printed out a new one that didn't have grade on it, uh, <laughs> um, but I didn't bring anything that I didn't, you know, get high marks on um, just because I didn't want to present something and then be like, well, why are you presenting me this? It's totally wrong. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, it, it, it was definitely something that helped uh, help stand out. Um, whether it was completely needed or not, who knows. Um, but it's something, if you're coming in with a, a binder full of things, might as well have a couple of them in there for you. Um, doesn't hurt. Worst case, you don't use it. And it's just sitting there and you walk out of it and you look at them and go, well, yeah, maybe I'll use them next time. Last question before I turn things over to the students. How many other Cal Poly grads are currently at Supply Chain? Uh, currently we have, there's four of us. Yeah, and then, in total, there's been nine people through there. Um, most of the others have, you know, either gotten their experience in the lab and uh, gone somewhere else to do more lab technician work. Um, and uh, actually there's, no, there's, sorry, take that back. There's been 11 of us through there. Um, a couple of them are now doing optical engineering. Um, uh, I think one's at Northrop, one's at uh, LH Harris, um, L3 Harris. Um, so it, it's a great place to get experience and really get your hands on optics because there's so much having to do. I mean, I took your class and I was like, okay, you know, there, there's a little bit to do with optics. No, it is a vast, vast <laughs> um, sector in engineering. And there's so much, so many applications that are now emerging from this. Anything with machine vision, LIDAR, um, anything that's going to learn autonomously besides a computer itself searching the internet is going to require optics in some way shape or form um, and on top of that you just have your typical applications uh, scanning things um, uh, observing the color of a bottle going through a factory to make sure that it's up to snuff um, counting particles in the air uh, for particulate counts or gas cell counts or whatever it might be. Uh, the amount of applications is really, really vast. Uh, so you get a really broad sense because we have roughly 120 customers and uh, close to 700 parts um, with about 60 different categories of parts. Um, yeah, right around there. Um, 
So, you know, if, if you start here, you go somewhere else, you really have a good idea of what you're, what you're breaking into. And we engage our customers. We really learn about their applications. So not only are you learning about the optics that go into that, you know, particular application, you're also getting a sense of the application, what it's good for. And uh, you, you do get to talk with their engineers and figure out a little bit more about it. Thank you. Students, um, you must have some questions. And um, if you don't mind, turn on your camera when you ask a question. Who wants to start? Come on, guys. OK, Andrew. Chase. Do you like your job at, well, no, you like your job at Supply Chain Optics, but are you content with where it has taken you and your experiences there? Do you see yourself moving elsewhere in the optics industry or anything um, else that you want to go into, but it might not offer you? Definitely content with where it took me. Um, I was able to grow to uh, essentially one of the three people at the top of the company um, within four years. Um, and, you know, everyone else uh, is in a growth position as well. Um, it really is, you know, the, there's something to be said about working at a corporate place. Um, yeah, okay, you might have a better starting pay sometimes, but you don't wind up getting experience. You're, you're pigeonholed into whatever they initially hire you for, and you really have to do something spectacular to get moved up. Um, here it's, you know, we're, we're all working together. There's nobody that's it's like, oh, no, 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 that person only does that. No, everyone does everything. Um, so it, it's really, a, I think, a benefit to being at a smaller company, personally, um, especially early in your career. Uh, you can advance fast, uh, you can move forward, you can get the experience. Um, but if you got somewhere else, they're going, okay, yeah, he, he's been here for two years and he's been a lab tech and yeah, he's doing a good job of sleeping there. Uh, <laughs> uh, corporate tends to, tends to kind of moot that. I don't know if that answered. <laughs> So this uh, company provides you with more than enough um, experiences that you're content with your position. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm still learning things every day. Um, plenty of opportunities to grow still and learn plenty of new things. Spencer, you have a question? Yeah, um, you mentioned that you're doing a lot of SolidWorks work uh, within the company. And I know that ZMAX is compatible with SOLIDWORKS, but I'm not 100% sure how they influence one another as far as if you know ZMAX, like I know a little bit of both. Um, I know you can just convert ZMAX file to a .stl, but when it comes to like manufacturing optics, is it more beneficial to know SOLIDWORKS for modeling certain lenses? Um. Depends on if you're only manufacturing lenses and mirrors and prisms, or if you're manufacturing the full optomechanical assemblies. Um, if you're doing that, you need both. Uh, there, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. You can't manufacture optics without ZMAX um, or Oslo, uh, or there's another one, uh, Code 5. Um, Oslo is, uh, I don't want to go back to that ever. <laughs> that's what I initially learned on. Um, but ZMAX is a, a really great program. Um, takes a lot. Code 5 is spectacular. Uh, but that one, I mean, you, you're going to be at a high-end defense contractor if you're using that. Um, and that one integrates really easily with uh, SolidWorks. Um, but SolidWorks and ZMAX, there is a bridge software. Uh, I forget exactly what it's called. Um, that allows the two to interface. You can actually do optical ray tracing in the SolidWorks software, uh, which is a lot more powerful than ZMAX when it comes to ray tracing, oddly enough. Doesn't quite make sense, but um, it's just how it is. Um, but 
I definitely think having a, a base in ZMAX is going to be your best bet. Um, having general knowledge of SOLIDWORKS uh, is good. Um, the thing that I would suggest is study up on anything thermal um, because that's typically your biggest barrier when it comes to optical mechanics is uh, the difference in CTE um, and radial expansion of the lens compared to the housing. CTE means coefficient of thermal expansion. And uh, to be clear, we were using Oslo in this class once upon a time because it used to be that Oslo was much easier with the educational licensing. ZMAX has gotten out in front of that and I could not be happier. And I actually had many alumni writing uh, letters of support when I asked the university for an upgraded license. Uh, Felipe, you had a question. Uh, hi, Jace. Um, you said you started as a lab technician first, is that correct? Mm -hmm. um, what were the requirements to apply for that job, that entry job? And also, what did you do as a lab technician? The requirements, um, when, I requ when I applied, it was slightly different than what it is now. Um, we're, we're growing a lot more, so we're, we're taking in um, more people to do various things. Before, it was pretty much strictly uh, you know, somebody in physics, somebody that can run experiments. Um, now we're bringing in people to do assemblies and uh, higher level um, component fixtures at the at the company. So it, it's a different skill set, something that you really kind of don't learn in college. Um, but the experiment side of things is definitely uh, where, where the physics comes into play. Um, and what would I do? Um, so typically the day uh, would run as get in, check your emails, um, grab a part off the shelf, uh, you know, there's a tiered set of list on what comes first, what comes second, what the priority is, what needs to go out. Um, grab that. You start the, you look up the, the drawing for it. Um, you also look up the inspection procedure that we have. Uh, and that will tell you, okay, this is a laid out structure of we need to check effective focal length, beam deviation, diameter, center thickness. Uh, if there's chamfers, uh, regularity, radius whatever it might be, any parameter, um, and the quantity to test. Um, and sometimes it's a special setup. You have to actually build your own uh, setup with you know, lasers, beam splitters, polarizers, whatever it might be to check a certain parameter. Because um, we do wave plates as well. Um, and through that, um, you test everything. You know, If anything's out of spec, um, usually winds up being 100% test, which is is what it is. Um, it's got to be done. It just takes a while. Um, and then uh, all the data is input. Um, everything's kept, you know, indefinitely. So that if customers ever go, hey, you know, you sent us a batch nine months ago, and we're just really curious about this one parameter. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. We got those. Send it over to them. Um, and then, uh, you know, depending on if there's any failing parameters, if they're, uh, if everything passes, it's just all release. If there's failing parameters, you have to separate out what's failing, what's not. Um, generate a, an NCMR, which is a non-conforming materials report. Um, send that off to the vendor, let them know, hey, you know, got to improve on this. Uh, we're sending this back. Either we just want credit or remake the batch, whatever it might be. Um, then, uh, Pending getting a special project from sales, you're, you're back to another inspection. All right, Kenneth, do you have a question? Um, yeah, um, uh, thank you. I also very appreciate um, your chemist uh, comment. Silly, silly chemist, am, am I right? <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, um, but my question is, do you recommend any other classes that we should take that is outside of maybe physics or optics or maybe in physics too? Like, um, I don't know, like computational physics or maybe like a stats class or extra math classes that will give us an edge 
um, in I guess in career wise, like making us stand out than the competitors. Um, so I'm not sure what year you are, um, or if this has now become a a prereq or not. Um, but I recommend taking linear algebra before you take quantum physics. Um, it'll just make things a lot easier. <laughs> uh, or is it mechanics? I forget which, but linear algebra before one of those two would yeah. be nice. Um, something I wish I took, uh, which I didn't, was computational. Um, uh, there's nothing that we're going to do as scientists uh, that's not going to be on a computer. Um, scientists or engineers, so knowing how to code is really useful. Uh, we actually had to code our own accelerometer to test a, a G-force test um, on a particular set of lenses that was going into to LIDAR. Um, so, you know, we were learning that on the fly versus if I'd taken computational, I might've had a, a base background and you know, that kind of code. Um, I really do recommend SOLIDWORKS, although I know the engineering department is pretty tight lip on uh, what they can let you in. I think that's one of the manufacturing engineering classes. Now that everything changes semesters, I don't know which one it is. Um, there are ways to learn. I mean, I know that um, Ertan Salik uses it for some of the projects in his research group and I think that there are engineering students who may know of ways to get your hands on a license and start practicing with examples online. Yeah, actually, if you're a, if you're a student, I think as long as you're using your Cal Poly email uh, to sign up for it, you can get a free license. It's a student license. It has a watermark that says student. You can't actually produce anything, um, although there's a way to get around that, um, but I won't go into that. Um, but that's a really, it's really useful, um, as well as if for whatever reason you can't find that, uh, I do know Fusion 360 is hundred percent free. Um, as long as you're not making over a hundred grand a year, uh, based on whatever you make on it. Um, I think you just have to sign up for like a hobbyist license or something like that, but it's a, it's basically a lighter version of AutoCAD, um, which AutoCAD is the computer, the comp competitor can talk. Um, to SOLIDWORKS. Diego, you have a question? Yeah, so I want to ask, like, how common is it for in the optics industry for um, for undergraduates who are current, who haven't graduated, who are, like, in their uh, junior or senior year to work a job, at, to work a part-time job as a, like, technician? Um, it hasn't happened terribly often. I think I might have been the only one. Um, just because we are a Monday through Friday. Um, you know, it, it's very flexible hours as long as somebody's in the building, which is typically 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Somebody's there. Um, you can be as well. It's just, yeah, if you're new, we need somebody to answer questions because there's a lot of inspections. Uh, we're also, we're developing procedures for everything right now, so it's a bit easier. Um, but it's, uh, as somebody who worked all through college, um, I worked almost full time, uh, my entire college and it's, it's a balance. Um, <laughs> you can either sleep, have a social life or have money. Um, and I chose social life and money, not a lot of sleep. Um, and good grades. So there's four of them actually. Um, but you, you really have to have to balance out um, what you do and how you do it. And if you do get a job somewhere uh, that's, you know, allowing you to work while you're in school, tell them outright, hey, you know, I'm in physics, got to be flexible. Um, sometimes it might be like the next week, I got a test coming up. Okay, cool. Hey, you know, I don't really feel prepared for this. Can I not come in tomorrow? Yeah, fine. Um, I mean, for us, it's always, uh, I do have some people that are in college currently. Um, I have one person rather that's in college currently. Um, and they ask me all the time, hey, you know, can I, can I work tomorrow instead of Friday? Yeah, sure, whatever. Um, at the end of the day, the, the job's gonna get done. Um, we have enough people there that are full-time that 
will get done regardless. Um, but it, if it's anywhere, just make sure that they're flexible. That's the biggest thing I can say, because you don't want to get pinned by a boss. It's like, nope, either you're here tomorrow or you're fired. Um, cause then your grades slip, nobody's happy. You're not happy at the end of the day. It just doesn't work. Thank you. Um, who else has a question? Um, Oh, we can't understand you. There's something wrong with the connection. Try it again. Can you hear me now? Um, it's very pixelated. Yeah, it's very. Um, tell you what, while you work on that, I'm going to ask a question. How has COVID affected um, both operations and the customer demand? Oh, man. Um, so. I was actually charged with our response. Um, well, so funny story, uh, I was actually supposed to go last January. Uh, my flight was supposed to leave on the 11th to an hour outside of Wuhan uh, to go visit a couple vendors. Um, my visa didn't come in time. It came literally six hours after my flight was supposed to leave. So by the time I was about to reschedule my flight, the news on COVID broke. Uh, so I was actually following it from January uh, moving forward. So come early March, I was telling my boss, I was like, hey, you know, we need to get everyone set up for Zoom. We need to get remote access going. Um, this is going to hit and it's going to hit hard. So we immediately, mid-March, sure enough, everyone shuts down. Um, and I'm getting pinged left and right from customers. Hey, you know, we're critical infrastructure on this, we're critical infrastructure on that, we're military, we're whatever. Um, we need you guys, are you staying open? Um, okay, we had to. Um, so in the early days of it, before we really knew much about it, um, you know, I had everyone mask up. Um, I think by the last week of March, that was a mandate in the company. Uh, if you're in the building, you were in a mask. Um, we sent everyone that could be remote home to be remote. Um, anyone that was in the building, uh, you know, you had the strict social distancing rules, only six, you know, greater than six feet apart. Um, if you're eating, you gotta go eat in your car, yada, yada, yada. Um, clean up after yourself, wipe things down. Um, and we did <laughs> something that I don't regret, but was very painful. Uh, which was split shifts. Um, and the only way to do that without dropping anyone's hours, therefore pay, uh, was to run uh, three days a week, 12 hour shifts, and four days a week, 10 hour shifts. So every other week you were on the opposite schedule. One week you were on three twelves, the other week you're on four tens. Um, and then, you know, we, we just gifted the extra four hours um, to everybody. And throughout that time, I was working seven days a week, 12 hours a day, um, because my people were working. And if they're going to be working, I'm going to be supporting them. <laughs> um, so that lasted until June. Um, so in the early weeks of June, everything looked like it was dying down. We obviously then got the summer surge, but we were also more knowledgeable on the virus. Um, we knew really how it transmitted, what precautions to take, everything associated with it. Um, and since then, we've had everyone remote, um, you know, the, the labs back together. Um, typically, our, our technical staff, uh, myself and a couple others, um, will filter in and out of the building uh, to help out with things, special projects and whatnot. Um, uh, but it, it's been it, it's been a blessing and a curse because it's really allowed a couple other people to to shine through. Um, they you know, people have stepped up in a huge way, um, and it's opportunities like this where you think it's going to be the biggest pain that really allows people to show kind of what they can do, what they're capable of, and uh, really what you know what they're able to do. I think the most encouraging thing I heard you say besides 
the general positive way that you're able to get through it is that you had so many critical infrastructure customers. It doesn't, and from everything I've been in touch with you occasionally over the past year, it sounds like um, business has been not taking a huge hit. Is that accurate? Yeah, we, uh, we only, our sales were 5% different than the year before. Wow. Um, so, you know, we had a couple customers drop off the ones that do some architectural lighting. Um, but then we had other customers, uh, particularly one that um, actually makes one of the, the PCR machines, the analysis machines. Um, you know, they said, hey, we're going to start making this machine. We need you guys to make the lenses prono. And it was a massive order that backfilled anything that fell off. Um, so that, again, that's the beauty of optics is it's in industries that don't fall wayside uh, if there's ever an emergency. Um, you know, take that as a blessing and a curse, whatever. Um, but everyone was able to have jobs. Um, everyone had their pay or more. And you now at the end of the day, we had some people get sick. Um, but nobody caught it in the company. We had uh, great procedures in place. Um, you know, if somebody was even a contact of somebody that was sick, we shut down for a period of time um, to get them tested, to get everyone else tested. And uh, I know there was a lot of companies that didn't do that, um, which I, I, you know, some some of my friends have had some horror stories on what they've had to work through, um, considering their essential infrastructure as well. Uh, but if, you know, again, it comes down to, does the company care more about you or their profits? And I never let the people fall by the wayside. That's not my forte. You mentioned the PCR mach machines. It's worth noting that last year, my final exam in this class was to analyze the specs for a lens for a uh, low cost plate reader for certain types of COVID research. So um, this, this stuff really is relevant even to the crisis we're in. Who else has a question? Who is it? Anyone that we haven't heard of? Keith or Juan or Madison or Jerry or Maximum or Ben. Well, if the people we haven't heard from yet uh, don't have any questions, uh, Andrew, you look like you have a second question or third question. Yes, can I be heard? Okay, now you can. Yep. Good. Um, I wanna go back to um, a little bit about, about our education and uh, job opportunities. Jace, you said you started out as a technician, um, but I've actually been looking at a lot of optics jobs recently, and a lab technician is offered at most optics companies. Um, sorry? Oh, this is point of connection. We can hear you. Can I say that again? You just cut out real quick. Okay. Oh, I think um, it's Jace's connection that was briefly freezing. So start over again. Uh, my question is, um, in the optics industry, lab technicians are needed. Mm -hmm. But if we haven't had much lab experience with optical systems, uh, maybe we've had a lot of programming, a lot of ZMAX, and a couple other areas that optics can touch, but not the physical labor that a lab technician would work with. Um, do you think that puts us at a huge disadvantage to people who've had that same practice? No? Um, I, I mean, okay, if you're going up against somebody with 10 years of experience and they're willing to, you know, work a, an entry level job at the same pay, yeah, you're at a disadvantage. Um, that's just the nature of business. Um, but you're going to, you're A, gonna come in with a physics degree um, which means you can problem solve. And that is a huge aspect because, sorry, Dr. Small, but 90% of what you learn in college, you're never going to use. I understand. Uh, <laughs> um, 
you're going to learn along the way. Uh, it's going to be a lot of trial and error um, and picking up tribal knowledge from people within the company. And through that, you're going to be able to grow and learn and, you know, really find your niche within the, within whatever company you're at. Um, but I, I wouldn't take the, oh, you know, I don't have a ton of experiences. I, my only optics knowledge was, um, Dr. Small's, uh, lens design class and, uh, Dr. Sleek's optics class. Um, other than that, it was what the 200 level class was. Um, I guess I had a little bit extra because I did some spectra work for Dr. Abramson. Um, but that was molecular spectra. It wasn't transmission reflection and all that other stuff. Um, so don't worry about what experience you do and don't have. Um, the other thing is also uh, don't get discouraged when you're applying for jobs. Um, I applied to I don't know, 40 or 50 um, before this one happened to land. Um, and was optics my first choice? No. Um, I, I, I enjoyed it. I was decent at it. I wasn't great by any shape of the imagination. Um, but, you know, once I got the job, I knew that I just, I wanted to move forward. And I wanted to progress. And if you just put your best foot forward and keep at it, that's really all you, yeah, that, that'll that take you far in life. By the way, two optics classes is more than a lot of universities offer. A lot of physics departments offer maybe one. So if you come out of here and all you have is two optics classes and some programming experience and a hard Vandervoort lab, you're already in pretty good shape for a whole lot of technical work. Um, oh, yeah. Madison, you have a question. Yeah, so I, I've heard of a lot of companies that are, um, I, I know you talked about your company being one to promote people and work on growth. Is your company one that encourages your employees to go for their master's degree? Or is it one where they, they help pay for tuition? Or at least, you know, I know you've talked about schooling. So how are they, if, if one, or like if I was to take the route where I work full-time and then go online to get my master's degree in optics, you know, how, how would they react to that? I guess. Is what um, well, I don't know about the master's degree. Um, we haven't had anybody attempt that one. Um, we do, there is a, a program through UCI uh, through their continuing education. Um, it's a certificate of optical engineering. or I, I forget the title of it. Um, but it's essentially five classes um, that we do uh, that plus there's a couple IVC classes um, in photonics and laser something I forget exactly what it is um, for all those ones the company does pay for it um, okay. if anybody's curious you know the, the more you learn and the more you can do uh, it only benefits the company so a little bit of help from us to you is the least we can do yeah. Um, in terms of the masters, though, I can't speak to that. Um, haven't really brought it up in conversation. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's definitely encouraged to get any additional education that you can. Okay. Thank you. And I think the UCI coursework, it is graduate level. It would be, it would certainly count towards the first few classes in a master's program at most good optics institutions. So that's something to keep in mind. And you get 10, 15, 10 or 15% off with OSSC. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else have a question? Keith. Um, actually, I had a question. Uh, was our what would be sources of information or like, is there any special information that if we wanted to get more involved in optics that we should look for or that you could point us towards other than obviously the classes and um, UCI and here, of course. Um, well, it happened to be online this year. It's actually going on right now. Um, so this might be a great thing. Um, SPIE 
uh, I, Society of Photonics, something, I forget exactly what it stands for. Um, Dr. Small would probably know. Um, but they're doing Photonics West right now. Um, and Photonics West is the largest optical conference trade show in America. Um, and that's happening right now. If you go to SPIE, I think it's .org, um, you can register. It's free. And you can walk the, the virtual tour site. Uh, it's happening Monday through Thursday. Um, so you have two more days of it. Um, and you can walk around, tour the virtual booths, uh, get an idea of what's out there. That's It's anything from people selling uh, full-blown instruments, interferometers, to people selling component parts like us, um, to, to offshore vendors, to local vendors, to whatever it might be. Um, that's all at that show. So that's actually a massive one. And they do have a bunch of classes that you can pay for. Uh, I think it's a I think it's a cheaper price this year because it's all online. Um, one of them uh, that I went to a while back was the optomechanical class. Um, it was an eight hour crash course and everything you need to know optomechanics. Um, that also gave you the opportunity to buy um, the textbook from them, which is really just a bunch of notes uh, from some doctorate somewhere. Um, but uh, at a drastically reduced price. Uh, so the class is 300 and normally the book is 200, but if you take the class, you can get the book for like 20 bucks. Um, so that's a really good resource. Um, all those classes that they offer during that. Uh, I don't know if you can still enroll for the classes. Unfortunately, I think that's a, a dead opportunity at this point. Um, but walking that would be great. Um, digitally walking it, obviously. Uh, what else? What else? What else? Um, I don't know what optics book you guys are using, but the Pedrotti optics book has helped me a lot. Um, we're I using the, the name of it. Okay, that's the other one. <laughs> that's the other one that I reference very often. Um, yeah, both of those two optics books are fantastic. Um, I like Sala and Heitch. It's it's a good reference for a lot of things with solid state devices. I'll drop the name into the chat. Um, do you read Photonic Spectra? Do you find that a useful read? Uh, haven't used it yet. Um, actually, something the magazine. No, no, I, I haven't really. I haven't really read through that one, but that does bring up uh, a very good point of, um, uh, and I hate to com I hate to promote a competitor, but the Edmonds catalog. Um, so before the Edmonds catalog, there was the Mel's Grio catalog, and the Mel's Grio catalog was fantastic because they had in the back about thirty or forty pages that gave you a massive rundown on a whole bunch of different optical components what they're used for and, you know, very particular specs that apply to them. Um, Edmund has started to pick that up um, and now they're adding that into their catalog. So if you just, and actually, if you go to the Photonics West online, um, you can go to the Edmund site, uh, their digital, whatever it is, uh, booth and you can sign up for it and they'll mail you a copy. Um, I don't know. It usually happens like a month after the show. Um, usually you just pick it up, but I think this year they're just mailing it to anyone that has it or it's a digital copy. I'm not really sure. Um, haven't looked at it yet, but it's a very, very, very useful quick reference guide. Um, also the Edmunds website itself has a, a quick reference guide of just, okay, this optic and this uh, Thor labs kind of has something similar. Um, Nowhere near in depth though. Um, so if you're really curious about optical components and kind of where they fit into things and where they play, uh, I would recommend the Edmonds catalog. Um, it'll have a lot of information for you. Thank you very much. Uh, 
All right, we are almost at the end of class time. So um, anyone who needs to go, you're free to do so. But if anybody wants to stick around, if Jace, if you have a few more minutes. Yeah. All right. Um, otherwise, I'll see you guys Thursday. But anyone who wants to stick around and ask a few more questions is free to do so. Who else wants to ask something? Spencer. I had a question. Um, just kind of like, could you describe uh, in your time working there, maybe like a technical problem that's fun for us physics majors that uh, you had a solution to or something? Just to give an idea um, of what it's like working in the industry. So actually when I first started, um, I got thrown into uh, an existing project that they were stuck on, um, which was a LIDAR system. Um, I'm sure you're, most of you are familiar with LIDAR. Um, for those that aren't, it's laser imaging of the surrounding area uh, coming back in and out of phase to show what the distance is away from an object. Um, and they had a massive problem. The, unfortunately, the auto industry requires uh, crazy temperature range requirements. Uh, negative 40 C to 80 C over the span of 20 minutes um, is what that has to uh, survive. And unless, and they wanted a, the customer wanted a passive design, something that could drop in alignment. Um, and in order to do a drop in alignment, you need a very tight tolerance between your mechanical housing and um, your optics. That doesn't work when you have that kind of temperature range. Um, you wind up with a lot of broken glass. So we spent uh, two of us probably three straight months um, testing different adhesives, uh, looking at you know, ways to alter the housing um, to accommodate it, ton of thermal work, um, uh, ton of stress work um, to finally figure out what combination of housing spacing coupled with um, the type of glue, uh, which if, <laughs> if you ever want to get into a very broad market, go into adhesives. Um, because there is about 800 adhesives for every one application. Um, and trying to find the right one with the right hardness, the right uh, elongation at break or at uh, tensile break, right tensile strength um, is a giant pain. Uh, but we wound up finding it, um, took a long time, but that was, that was a really challenging one. That was probably the longest. Um, we've had others uh, in particularly today um, I was in the office uh, trying to work on an alignment procedure um, for a customer that uh, images um, silicon wafers and um, the, the specs on it are the absolute best you can possibly get. They want zero this, zero that, zero that, zero that. It's, it's incredibly hard to not only produce the optic, but to produce the assembly. And we're producing it in somewhere that's not a production assembly <laughs> uh, site. We're producing it in a metrology lab. Um, so we finished um, 3D printing all the accessories that we needed um, to build the fixture. Uh, we got it all up and running. Um, had a failure come back to us. You know, we, we thought we had it good. Um, broke everything down today, rebuilt it all. And uh, about 30 minutes before this call, we finally actually had a good result. Um, and then I rushed over here. Uh, <laughs> um, so tomorrow, hopefully uh, <laughs> that result will hold. Um, so no, I, I'm, I'm no stranger to <laughs> false hope, uh, but I hope it's not the case in this one. We can, we can take time for one or two more questions if anybody has one. 
Yeah, Keith. Um, so we've been kind of talking about a lot of random things, not like random things, but um, I'm just kind of writing down some of the things. So it's like programming is a good kind of soft skill that's not related to school, um, working with AutoCAD, Zen Max, and then now 3D printing. Is there anything else, like some sort of technical skill that we could work on outside of school that could help us a little bit better or just? Um, the, the least technical skill that you need. Um, actually just great communication and documentation. Um, I've seen a couple people that could do so much more if they were able to communicate out what they've done and how they've done it um, rather than it just being trapped in their head. And you know they can produce it, they do a wonderful job at it, um, but they can't articulate it. So that's definitely, uh, I mean, in, in terms of technical, sure, there, there's a hundred different things. Go down the STEM majors and, you know, pick a class and you'll need that. Uh, that, that that's useful in some way, shape or form. Um, and, you know, a great technology emerging right now is renewables. Um, there, we do have a, a pretty fantastic regenerative studies um, think it's a major at Cal Poly? Um, Not sure, but it's but definitely an, an institute or something. Yeah, um, the, I know the energy engineering, uh, which I minored in, um, has a couple classes in regenerative studies. Um, that's anywhere from home building to, you know, lead infrastructure and all that stuff. Uh, speaking of lead, um, which is the, the massive certification body for uh, anything regenerative um, and green. Um, Six Sigma, uh, that is something. It, so Six Sigma has this belt class structure. There's green belt, black belt, so on and so forth, champion, all the way to the top. Um, and that is a very, very massive thing if you're going into corporate. Um, that can mean... <laughs> If you have your black belt, uh, you start out at 20 to 30 K above anybody else. Um, just because you have it. And what it means is Six Sigma is a, a manufacturing strategy. Um, it's kind of associated with lean manufacturing, which is another manufacturing strategy, um, but it's slightly different. It means that the standard deviation of your products um, defects per, I believe, 1 million products is no greater than the six sigma of it. Um, and it, it's, it won't make sense now, um, but if you start reading into it, um, you can pick up a book online for 50 bucks. Um, you know, everything you need to know about six sigma uh, sometimes they offer discounts on the black belt, the black belt course because um, you have to actually get a certificate and saying, okay, yes, I, I went through all this. I took the class or I didn't take the class. I took the test um, and I either passed, you know, my green, black or whatever belt it is. Um, I forget the exact structure of it, uh, but that's, that's a big one. Anyone else? All right, then, if there are no other questions, Jace, thank you so much for doing this. I hope we're able to someday bring you to visit a class in person. Um, and thank you everyone for asking very good questions. This would have been a much less fulfilling event if there hadn't been any good questions. So uh, thank you everyone. And uh, Jace, I hope to see you at an Optical Society meeting soon and the rest of you, I'll see you Thursday night. Definitely. Thanks, everybody. And right. thank you, Dr. Small. Thank Talk you. Talk soon. Bye. Thank, thank you. you.